don't know. I think it, 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 maybe it's the cuts. I don't know. Do you think we're cutting back in folk? I don't know where folk are. Anyway, lovely to see you all this morning. Welcome to Wish Your Old Parish Church. On this, our Communion Sunday and also our celebration of the Platinum Jubilee. Let's just think back those 70 years, those of you who can, as we prepare ourselves for our worship today. God's call to worship is from the book of Daniel. (laughs) Then there will be times of trouble, the worst since the nations first came into existence. When that time comes, all the people of your nation, whose names are written in God's book, will be saved. The wise leaders will shine with all the brightness of the sky, and those who have taught many people to do what is right will shine like the stars forever. Let's join in singing our first hymn of praise, Make Way, Make Way, hymn 279. King of Kings. We celebrate the birth, the life, and the service of Her Majesty this morning. Let us join our hearts and minds in prayer today. Lord, we gather on this day to remember and recall our Sovereign Lady, Her Majesty the Queen. Bless her and her family as we give thanks for her unwavering commitment to public service over her lifetime. 
for she believed that she was called by you. We give thanks for our nation. We give gratitude for all the freedoms and benefits that we take for granted. Let us be a nation of Christ, a nation of opening, of warm hospitality, of compassion and respect for our neighbor, qualities that our Queen has exemplified. Lord, we give thanks for her example of a deep faith, for the sacrifices that she has made during her life, for the duty that she has given. May we too follow that faith of our Lord Jesus as we sacrifice for his church and for others. May we see duty as an honor and an offering to you. Lord, let us reflect upon the changes in our culture and society and praise the manner in which our monarch has fostered her people, cherished its customs, and lived up to the standards of public life. Let her life as it is gracious, let her life as it is fitting, let her life as it is loving be blessed today. Lord, we encourage one another to love each other with respect and joy, praying for the prosperity of all. For in living God, we move and we breathe in the wonder of your creation in this world. Bring grace, mercy, and the sense of the divine into our lives as we join together now in praying the prayer that Jesus taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever. Amen. Can I just say how, how lovely it is to see you all in the middle? Because you sound so much louder when you're singing uh, and, and when you were saying the Lord's Prayer. Today's All Age Address is about predictions. Let me predict that next Sunday you'll all go back and sit in the same seats as you used to sit. Okay? Now, I want to predict for, for some of our younger people... Um, I want to predict um, that somewhere you'll find a £20 note if you come out into the chancel. <laughs> you can see the boys are the fastest. So if you, you kind of look, maybe, maybe look, look under, un, under things. Don't take anything else apart from the £20 note because you might see, see, see other things. Okay. Ah, uh, uh, no, no, don't take any other things, because you might get them later. Okay. Can you predict? And I predict they won't find it. Just put that down there. Thank you. Okay. So why don't you come back here, and I predicted that you would never find the £20 note, because, because that's right, I, 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 I left it in there. Let's see what the next prediction is. Hold on, because there's quite a few predictions here. Okay. Um, okay, so if you're standing there, right, and no, I think you'll need to be closer, Georgia. Okay, so the next one, I predict that as you run round the pulpit, Ben will get there first. Am I going to be right? No! Oh, my God, my predictions are wrong again. Hey, goodness me. Okay, um, I predict this time round, oh, I'm not sure, I'm looking at Georgia now, uh, and I'm, I'm going to change what's on my sheet. I predict that when we have the loudest and highest voice, it will be Georgia. 
So Matthew, you have a shot first. Shout as loud as you can out to the back of the church. Shout. Ah! Right, Ben, have a go. Ah! Right, Georgia. Ah! Oh, I think it was a close run thing between the two girls there, wasn't it? There we go. Okay. So I predict that if you look round and look under things, not under the cross, that you'll find something with the Queen's head on it. And you can keep it, by the way. Look under things, look on things. Oh, Oh, yes, find it. Find it. Any others? I think there's a there's some, there's some. Yes, you get to keep it. There we go. Keep looking. I think I think there's still one left, but I think it's about unfair because I only I put six out. So right, okay. Back to your seats now. Now, did you get one? I predict that Matthew's going to give you one that he found. <laughs> well done. I think Matthew should get a clap there, hasn't he? Yeah. And I predict that Ben found the extra one and he's going to put it in, in the collection plate. <laughs> I predict now that you want to hear a scary story. Yes. Yes, okay, okay. So this is the most remarkable story I have ever, ever told. And it's about predictions. Long, long ago, there was a man called Daniel. And Daniel, at the court of King Balthazar, read dreams and predicted what the dreams were made of. The first dream that he had, he saw a lion, but not any old lion, a lion that could walk over water and a lion that had wings. What did that mean, thought Daniel. Then, the creatures are getting scarier as they come along, he saw a bear in the water and the bear didn't have tusks. But the bear had ribs in its mouth. What a strange, strange dream. That was so that he could eat lots of things up. The next dream he had was even more weird. He saw a leopard with four head and wings as well. What could this mean? But the last one was the scariest of all. He saw a creature that had ten horns all over its back. And it too was walking over the water. The horns had eyes at the end of them so they could see everyone. And this creature was desired to crush the earth and to eat everything in sight. It was the scariest thing that anyone in the world would ever, ever see. Next, Daniel dreamt that he saw a great light. Daniel dreamt that he saw an image of God. And it was so, so bright you couldn't see. And somehow as he looked and looked and looked into the image, there was a beard as white as a sheep's. Snowy white. And from that image, there was fire. Fire was breathed from this ancient of days. Why was it called the Ancient of Days? Because it would last forever. From the beginning of time until the end of time, the Ancient of Days and the kingdom of the Ancient of Days would not pass. Daniel awoke and thought, what did these four beasts mean? How am I going to 
explain this to Balthazar. I'll tell you. The four beasts meant the great kingdoms and empires of the world. And Balthazar's kingdom, the kingdom of Israel, was a small kingdom. And one kingdom would come and tear its claws. The other kingdom would come and eat up. The other kingdom had many heads. And the last kingdom would crush the kingdom of Israel. Daniel was very scared. But then he remembered the second part of the dream. And he remembered the creature with ten horns. And the ten horns represented the ten kings of that great empire. And yet the Ancient of Days would come. And Daniel thought, and Daniel predicted that God would come and destroy the creature. And so it was in the dream that Daniel's prediction was that someone would come and destroy it. And that man was known as the Son of Man. And the Son of Man would come to the earth and not the kingdom of the lion or the kingdom of the bear or the kingdom of the four-headed creature, or the kingdom of the ten-spiked creature, but the kingdom of the Son of Man would reign forever. Do you know who the Son of Man was? Jesus. It was Jesus. And we've heard many, many stories about Jesus. And when Jesus was alive, they called him the Son of Man. Today we are celebrating 70 years of the Queen's reign, but in the dream, Daniel was celebrating the eternity of Jesus' reign. And we're going to look more at that weird and wonderful dream later in our service. Let's sing now our all age hymn, All That I Am and All That I Do. prediction that after the song you're going to walk past here. <laughs> and I predicted that the girls would walk the other way. Aha!
And my last prediction is that they will remember this service. I wonder. Our scripture passage today comes from 1 Peter. 1 Peter chapter 1, reading verses 1 to 9.
We bless you for our faith, for Elizabeth, our Queen, our devotion to Jesus Christ, our unashamed witness to this cause, our love of our church, and our commitment to its worship. May we, in our own day and generation, continue in faith and dedication to the same Lord, in whose name we offer these prayers. Amen. The TV presenter Brian Cox described this week civilizations that gain power are almost destined for apocalyptic consequences. A few weeks ago, the governor of the Bank of England, Andrew Bailey, he predicted that inflation would have apocalyptic effects. People are, are rightly conscious of any future pandemics. And here I, I put out the, about the only um, non-shocking picture of monkeypox that I could find. It has reared its, its, its ugly head. And one of the commentators this week said the future consequences of monkeypox would be apocalyptic in a biblical sense. That's a cheery start to a Platinum Jubilee sermon, isn't it? Eh? All about the apocalypse. Woe, woe, and thrice woe, said Senna the soothsayer. Do you remember the silly comedy of the 1970s? So much of what people have been talking about this week, about going back to it, eh? inflation and all these types of things they've been talking and, and rail strikes they've been talking about go back to the 70s so I thought right let's go back to Frankie Howard's Up Pompey and a character called Senna, Senna the soothsayer who was, who was an actress called Jean Mockford I didn't know that and she used to come on in every episode and go whoa whoa and thrice four and Frankie Howard would turn to the camera and he would go, oh, it's a shame, isn't it a shame? And other things which I'm not going to repeat in a sermon. Does religion come into its own when people think we're doomed? People seek answers. People seek solace. People look to something beyond themselves to to solve the issues of the world. And the word apocalypse, or apocalyptic, was the Greek word for revelation. And this is a nice definition of revelation. It's an unveiling, an unfolding of things not previously known, which could not be known apart from the unveiling. The Old Testament prophets were believed to be the source of the unveiling of God and what God wanted. And so hence in the story of Daniel, Daniel, the famous man from the lion's den, Daniel becomes a dream reader. He's unveiling God in the dreams. The court of King Balthazar. And here we have an apocalyptic vision. The four monstrous beasts that we heard of in, in our old age talk. Rising from the sea. I didn't really do justice to that story because I didn't really want to make it so, uh, so scary. But the, the fourth character with the ten horns, the writer of Doctor Who would have been proud of it. It's depicted in the passage in a most evocative way. Now, the ten horns with eyes, and then there's other horns on the, the, the creature's body. And then it, it says in the Daniel passage that this creature will come and devour the whole earth, treading it down, crushing it down. But then it says in the next breath, 
God like the ancient of days. It's a lovely expression of God will come to judge and destroy the beast and rule over the earth for eternity. It's a a wonderful, wonderful story. And in this vision, there is a, a holy being, the Son of Man figure, which became Jesus. But it explains the meaning of the dream. In the dream, the four beasts were four different kingdoms, four different empires. And the fourth kingdom had ten kings, as I said in the address, and then the king will come to make war with three kings. And it gets very complicated until at the end we have the prediction that the Son of Man would reign eternally. The ancient world was, was happy with a God that came to meet them was happy with a God who would break into humanity and inspire people to to greatness and conquest. But the danger of passages like these, which were metaphorical, they were metaphorical when they were told, and they're metaphorical now. It's a vision, it's a dream. And the danger was that in later centuries, people saw this dream literally. And it was used, passages like this were used to justify the soldiers of the church going and intervening in worldly disputes. There was a a divine twist behind conflicts to justify them. We see all over the world now some Christian cultures justifying their actions. In Africa, in Russia, in America, apocalyptic responses are in vogue. And yet we shy away from these imaginative and creative stories of the Bible, failing to take the the message that lies behind them. Brian Cox identified that power corrupts. Andrew Bailey identified that fuel and food inflation will have catastrophic effects on our limited income. And with the pandemic, well, it was just two weeks ago, America passed a million mark for deaths. The latest figures I've read for Britain is is 179,000. And that's probably an underestimation. In the world, at the end of last year, there was 529 million cases of COVID. The end of 2021, that was 629 million deaths. So do we live in apocalyptic times? The the early church believed that they lived in apocalyptic times. They believed that the end of the world as they knew it was coming to an end. Hence the passage in 1 Peter. This famous picture is known as the unveiling. It's the four horsemen of the apocalypse. And so we get that lovely passage from 1 Peter. And the first few verses, it is... The writer of 1 Peter is is addressing the new churches of the early Christian world. And the people are described as God's chosen people who live like refugees. And then the writer uses the, the words of Hosea. You are wandering round like sheep without a shepherd over their souls. Wandering round like sheep, like a shepherd without a shepherd over their souls. And so people were identified as the people by Jesus' spirit. They were identified as the people of God by the obedience to God's message. And finally, it tells us that by their belief in sacrifice and purity of his blood. Liquor's not going today. Here we go. Today is the Jubilee weekend, and much of its value is about the the cohesiveness of 
our society and our culture, and there's been many tributes paid to Her Majesty. And I don't know if you were watching the, the TV last weekend, but there was a horse display and a, and a kind of pageant last weekend as well. And the TV personality, Alan Titchmarsh, was, was doing this uh, presenting bit. So Alan, there's Alan behind the, the podium trying to say nice words about the Queen. And so he, he, he says these words, he says, and she embodied the heart of the nation. And so the camera goes to the picture of the Queen and what does she do? She raises an eyebrow and goes, oh dear me, wasn't that so sycophantic? Now obviously what Alan was trying to do was he was trying to, to symbolise what she meant. But um, I don't think she quite liked that from her reaction. Let's have a nicer picture of the Queen. There we go. Every age, every era, every point in history comes to an end. That's why it's history. Whether it's a, a monarch, whether it's a historical period and people will look back to this area as the, the Elizabethan area, the modern Elizabethan area, whether it's a church, whether it's the identity of a, of a people, it all changes. She won't be on the throne in a few years' time. We know that. That's inevitable. No one's actually using any words of her demise, but we know it's going to come. And so the writer of First Peter knows that changes are coming. And he wants to give that set of people what sort of change is happening. He wants to give them hope. He wants to give them certainty. And so he starts with this passage with a thanks. There's been a lot of thanksgiving this weekend, isn't there? It's been wonderful. And last night, if you were watching the Jubilee program, they had about every 15 minutes a celebrity or a well-known person coming up and giving Her Majesty thanks. So here's the writer of Peter saying, thank you, Jesus. Thank you that you are risen and that your people will be risen. And then he gives us probably the most seminal passage in the whole of Scripture, just my opinion. He says, Jesus will fill us with living hope. And that's what often the commentators have called this passage. This is the passage of living hope. If there's anything you take away from today, it's that it fills you with living hope. And he goes on to commentate that the things of the earth will fade away. But not God's promise. Not God's prediction. Not God's power of salvation. And so the, the early believers of Christianity believed that Jesus was coming and that the end of the world would happen. And he, you've, you can remember scripture passages where the dead would rise up and everybody would be together in the kingdom of God. They believed that that was going to happen in their lifetime. We know it didn't. But we know that life changed. And in the next centuries, they believed that the second coming would be near. Would it be the second century? Would it be the fourth century? Would it be the fifth century? Would it be the sixth century? And by that time, they were beginning to change their theological beliefs. And then as the church grew stronger and stronger from about the 6th century onwards, into medieval Christianity, they began to impose the kingdom of God by war. We know that. Soldiers of Christ arrive and put your armor on. For centuries, Christianity fought with Islam. Christianity fought amongst itself. Christianity fought with the pagan religions and it imposed its will on the world. And then we had the time when people believed that the church had become corrupt and we call it the Reformation. 
Now, we in the Protestant church, we believe in the Reformation, but there was lots of Reformations within the Roman Catholic Church because people saw the church is imperfect. Its worldly power had corrupted it. And we know that to be the case. But the kingdom of heaven, the city of God, was still to be believed in. And then we go on the centuries and we come to the 17th, 18th, the 19th century, the time of what is described of as the Enlightenment. And the Enlightenment didn't believe that God would create the kingdom of God on earth. They believed that we, man, would achieve heaven on earth. And throughout history, particularly in the Victorian era, they believed that the kingdom of heaven could be created on earth. And the Victorians did amazing, amazing things. Look at all these churches we have. They built so many churches in the Victorian era. They provided so much charity, they called it, to the poor and to the different parts of the evolving world. And then we reach the 20th century and the 21st century, and there is still conflict. And there is still inflation. And there are still people calling that the apocalypse will come. So what are we to make of that? Can we still believe in that living hope? The writer of First Peter ends by saying, Then you will receive praise and glory and honor on the day when Jesus Christ is revealed. In each and every generation, we have to reveal Jesus. Not just 2,000 years ago. Not just in the first six centuries, when they were hoping he would come again. Not just in the medieval period, where they were trying to have wars and impose. Not just in the Reformation. Not just in the Enlightenment. But today, Jesus Christ must be revealed. And then he goes on to say, you love him although you have not seen him. Shortly we will approach the table to celebrate and to remember the life and the witness of Jesus and to be part of that still. And yet you believe in him. We've gathered here this morning because of belief and faith. And then it goes on to say, so you rejoice with a great and glorious joy which words cannot express. I can say all the words I want, whether it's in a sermon or we sing a hymn or I'll say the words of institution. But at the end of the day, the sacrament of Holy Communion is about an emotion. It is about a deep down connection between us and Jesus. Our church emphasizes the remembrance aspect of the communion <laughs> service. Other churches call communion the Eucharist, which means thanksgiving. Other churches call it the Mass, the communion, the connection between the believer and God. Whatever denomination, we share all those beliefs. And then it goes on to say, because you are receiving the salvation for your souls. So as we approach this table, as we take our bread and we drink our wine and we remember Jesus, we give thanks for his life, we are drawn in reverence into communion with him. And then at the end of 1 Peter it says, which is of the purpose of of your faith in him. It is that connection between ourselves and Jesus that we now celebrate. Let's join in singing now. Worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness and prepare ourselves to share in the Lord's Supper.
thanks for the blessing that we have received, these symbols of bread and in wine. The thanks of the life of Jesus Christ, who has given meaning and purpose to our own life. Lord, we remember the sacrifice on the cross, your sacrifice for the sins of the world. In this sacrament, we lay down our sins, <coughs> receiving your mercy and your forgiveness. Lord, by bread and by wine, by the blood and the body, we are brought into communion with you, brought into communion with our brothers and sisters of the faith, celebrating this act all around the world. We are part of your church the body of Christ, in each and every era, your name is proclaimed. The predictions and the dreams and the promises of you are they to be fulfilled in each and every age. Lord, we remember those who have gone before us and those who are at ever trace in thy everlasting God. Still part your glorious work. And Lord, as we go forth from this meal, as we go forth from this sharing, we go forth in joy. For you are the living hope. No matter what goes on in the world, you are that hope that sustains, renews, and resurrects us in each and every era. This we pray in your name. Good morning friends and welcome to our service on this bright and sunny day of celebration. Whether you're here in person, watching online or listening on the telephone later, I do hope we will all have experienced a blessing from this shared worship, even at a distance. <coughs> our Jubilee party will start in the hall later on, following the close of the service, so there will be no tea and coffee after the service. However, there will be a retiring offering to close our service in aid of the benevolent fund. Our thanks today go to Keith for the conduct of his worship and his earlier surprise visit as Beadle, uh, to Neil for his reading, and to Neil Billy and May for the preparation of the PowerPoint and the recording of the service for later transmission. On Wednesday evening of this week, uh, Gary Druff, who is a mission partner in Malawi, is uh, visiting Dales and his church in Morrow and he will be speaking there at 7pm. 
so that's 7 p.m. on Wednesday evening. A whole event is organised by the Guild that is open to anyone to attend and share in that. On a health front, we are glad to see George and May Martone and Billy and May Hawthorne back with us following their period of isolation. Uh, Tom Boyd is continuing his recovery at home, but we're delighted this morning to have Rena Boyd with us back in person. Great to see you, Rena, looking so well, but remember, call Connie, <laughs> steady on. <laughs> we send as always our best wishes to all those who are ill, either at home or in the hospital, and we would remember them in our prayers. During our communion session, uh, our communion season, can I remind you all that we will still be collecting donations from the food bank, uh, these donations of non perishable foodstuffs and hygiene products can be placed in the box at the rear of the church. On the screen, we need a, 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 a queue system here. Uh, coming up on the screen shortly. <laughs> shortly. There we go. There we go. Uh, the, the first uh, is a selection of uh, photographs of some of the boys in the junior and company section of our boys brigade company enjoying their weekend charm. Uh, on your behalf, can I congratulate all the officers and all the boys of all the sections of the company who have worked so well over a period of restriction uh, and are now back to a full programme, albeit that it's just in time for the holidays. And the next photograph is a group of uh, brigade members who form part of the representation at the Tripping of the Colour as part of the Jubilee celebrations on Thursday. Shown in the photograph is Andy Bryson, a member of our senior company, and he is there with that group. We offer our congratulations to Andrew, not just in this singular order, but also his award of the Queen's Badge. And while we're on a note of congratulations, can I offer on your behalf our best wishes and congratulations to Junior Gray and Walter Gray, uh, who celebrate birthdays this week. And finally, a word of thanks to all who have worked so well to tastefully decorate the hall for our Jubilee celebration and those who will prepare and will serve our Jubilee for the following session. These are all the intimations for today. As always, Stay safe, stay calm, stay clean, and God bless you all. And a thanks are due to uh, Tom for all the intimations this morning. Um, a, a special word of, uh, of, of saying hello from Tom Boyd. Uh, I went to see Tom at the beginning of this week, and he is remarkable, absolutely remarkable. So if you're watching Tom, you're remarkable. We close our service with a, a favourite hymn of, of many, hymn 476, Mine Eyes Have Seen the Glory.
the truth of Almighty God march on as we ask for the blessing in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. 